Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Lana Turner reigned as one of Hollywood's box office queens for more than two decades. Real life was much trampier. Apart from her many films, Turner's tumultuous personal life, seven husbands, eight marriages, ensured she was always in the public eye. How Lana Turner's daughter stabbed her mother's boyfriend. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. The scandal that rocked Lana Turner's world. Crime of the century, the Lana Turner and Johnny Stompanato affair and murder. On the night that Beverly Hills Police were called to the home on North Bedford Drive, cinema femme fatale, Lana Turner was already on her way to becoming a Hollywood legend. Lana Turner was one of the biggest stars to grace the silver screen. Not only was she glamorous and classy, but she was elegant and was regarded as Hollywood's sex symbol. Turner later confessed to hating the title. Despite the glamour, Turner faced many pitfalls throughout her career, mainly in her love life. Lana was born Julia Jean Mildred Frances Turner on February 8, 1921. She was born into a working-class family in the town of Wallace, Idaho. Though her parents did not have a lot of money, Lana had fond memories of the music they would play after dinner. Her parents loved music and the family would sing and dance each night to the records they played. Lana's father worked as a coal miner at a local mine. The work was hard and he did not make much money. To supplement his income, he would play cards. He was an excellent card player and often he won money that he used to buy things for his family. On his way home one night after doing very well at the card table, Lana's father was robbed and murdered. When Lana was a teenager, she and her mother moved to Southern California in search of better job opportunities. Lana found her escape from hardships in the cinema. She would save a nickel of her lunch money every day so that she would have 25 cents to go to the movies on Saturday. She loved the beautiful costumes and jewellery actresses like Kay Francis wore, and she found herself wanting to wear the same wonderful clothes worn by her idols on the big screen. Not long after moving to California, she was approached by W.R. Wilkinson, a magazine publisher, and asked if she was interested in acting. She was soon introduced to Mervyn Leroy, who cast her in his upcoming movie. Before he cast her, he thought she needed a catchier name. She suggested Lana and he agreed. In They Won't Forget, Julia, now Lana, played the small part of a schoolgirl. Though the part was insignificant, critics were impressed with her ability and she received good reviews. This part also produced her nickname, The Sweater Girl, because of the tight blue sweater she wore in the movie. When Leroy went to work for MGM Studios, he took the 20-year-old Lana with him and her career took off. She was soon making a large salary, and one of the things she did was to buy her mother a new house where they both could live. Her career flourished, and she was soon making important movies and making big money. Included in her many hits are classics like The Postman Always Rings Twice, The Three Musketeers, The Bad and the Beautiful, Homecoming, Peyton Place, Madame X, and Imitations of Life. Using her newfound fame, she helped raise money for the US effort in World War II. Lana went on railroad tours to sell war bonds. She wrote her own speeches and promised a sweet kiss to any man who purchased a bond worth $50,000 or more. And I kept that promise hundreds of times, she said. I'm told I increased the defense budget by several million dollars. Her pinup photograph was a favorite with GIs the world over, but her personal life was not as happy as her career. Lana's personal life was scandalous to say the least. She liked men and was never shy about admitting it. She was married seven times. She first got married when she was 20 years old and the marriage lasted less than six months. She did not have much luck with the next six marriages either, with most of them lasting less than two years. For eight hours she was briefly engaged to Howard Hughes. Lana also had the misfortune of dating a man named Johnny Stompanato, who hid his identity as a small-time gangster and associate of Mickey Cohen. Turner's attitude towards romance was as if she was flipping a switch. 
Once she was charmed, she was in love. Unfortunately, not all her lovers were as attentive and caring as she hoped. Some were just slimy and abusive. One evening, he and Lana got into an argument and Johnny threatened to hurt her. Lana's 14-year-old daughter, Cheryl Crane, was outside the room listening and went into the kitchen to get a butcher knife when she heard the threat. After Turner was discovered in front of the Top Hat Malt Shop in Hollywood in 1936, her legacy as an actress ushered in a myriad of people who eventually became her directors and boyfriends. Unlike Judy Garland and Shirley Temple, Lana Turner was not the innocent type and was a well-known party girl. Sure, being a party girl in Hollywood isn't a stigma today, but party girls had a bad reputation in the 1930s and Turner was dubbed the nightclub queen. Despite Louis B. Mayer's concern, Turner was going to enjoy life to the fullest, including men. Unlike her mother, Cheryl Crane was far from a party girl. In fact, Turner made certain that Crane was watched over like a hawk on a rabbit. From nannies to governesses, Crane was never left alone under any circumstances, which was stifling for a pre-teen. Turner was an overprotective mother who sought to protect her child at any cost. Perhaps it was to prevent her daughter from creating scandal, as Turner did in her youth. Regardless, Turner's relationship with her daughter was distant, but Crane knew her mother loved her in her own way. It was Crane's love for her mother that forced her to one day commit an inconceivable offence. Crane described her mother as a wild and free spirit who wasn't shy about her sexuality. After being asked about the multiple men coming in and out of her life, Turner once told a reporter, let's face it, it's the physical that attracts me first. She went on, if you get to know a man's heart and soul, that's icing on the cake. Turner would link arms with Hollywood hunks such as George Raft, Victor Mature and Richard Hutton. I liked the boys and the boys liked me, Turner said. All the men in Turner's life would fizzle and fade, but not Johnny Stompanato. But by the late 1950s, Turner was a Hollywood veteran of 20 years with a sheltered teenage daughter and a waning career. Perhaps chasing her youth, she began dating Johnny Stompanato, a brooding gangster four years her junior. Stompanato was a notorious playboy and loathed by police and Hollywood alike, but he was tolerated because he enjoyed the protection of contacts in LA's criminal underworld. Born to Italian-American parents in Illinois, John Stompanato Jr. was sent to a military academy before he joined the Marines in 1943 and saw action in the Pacific Theatre of World War II. After he was discharged in China, he met Sara Utash, a Turkish dressmaker. He converted to Islam for her and they wed in May 1946. Stompanato briefly ran a seedy nightclub before abandoning his wife and newborn about a year later. He moved to Los Angeles where he found work with Maya Mickey Cohen, the infamous LA mob kingpin. Stompanato acted as the mobster's bodyguard and pimp. Meanwhile, Stompanato had a notorious fondness for starlets and soon set his sights on the foremost femme fatale, international superstar Lana Turner. Turner soon discovered that Johnny Stompanato, renowned for his violent temper, was more than she'd bargained for and suffered physical and mental abuse at his hands. But then Turner's daughter took matters into her own hands and fatally stabbed Stompanato one fateful April night in 1958. What ensued was a scandal the likes of which Hollywood had yet seen. Despite some reservations, Turner opened her life to Johnny Stompanato. She paid for his living expenses and his gambling debts and introduced him to her 14-year-old daughter, the child of her second marriage to restaurateur Stephen Crane. Stompanato was often violent with Turner and reportedly abused her during their frequent arguments while Crane looked on. Stompanato once even threatened to mutilate Turner's face and torture her daughter. It took less than a year for Turner to decide that her gangster wasn't a good long-term prospect, Stompanato's rage reportedly reaching its boiling point on the night of the 1958 Academy Awards when Turner refused to bring him as her date. But that night, April the 4th, 1958, her status as a noir icon was sealed in blood. According to court proceedings, Turner planned to cut Stompanato off for good on the night of April 4th, 
and warned Crane that the evening would be a tough one. Stompanato came over to their house only to have Turner allegedly tell him, Tonight, mister, I'm giving you your walking orders. I'm through with you. It's over. At this, Stompanato flew into a rage, threatened to murder Turner along with her mother and Crane, who overheard the fight from her upstairs bedroom. Stompanato had been stabbed in the abdomen with a butcher's knife. Before the night was out, Turner's 14-year-old daughter confessed to delivering the fatal wounds. On the floor of her upstairs bedroom lay the lifeless body of Johnny Stompanato, her handsome tough guy beau. In the official courtroom account, a terrified crane ran downstairs to the kitchen, grabbed a butcher's knife and crept to her mother's bedroom door. Opening the door, she mistook a clothes hanger in Stompanato's hand for a gun and impulsively stepped forward and plunged the knife between his ribs. Johnny Stompanato was dead within minutes. His last words were, My God, Cheryl, what have you done? Cheryl Crane, whose father was restaurateur Stephen Crane, said she stabbed Stompanato to protect her mother from what she thought was Stompanato's homicidal rage. At the time, this Hollywood tragedy caused a media frenzy. Continue listening for an inside look on what really happened that night at Turner's home and why this continues to be one of Hollywood's wildest tales. The papers loved the story and the coroner's inquest was one of the most sensational legal hearings Hollywood has ever seen. Turner's tale on the stand was riveting, a wayward mother in distress and the faithful daughter who comes to her rescue. I walked toward the bedroom door, Turner testified. He was right behind me and I opened it and my daughter came in. I swear it was so fast I truthfully thought she had hit him in the stomach. I never saw a blade. A Stompanato friend's outburst in court implied that it was Lana who wielded the knife, but the coroner declared the whole thing justifiable homicide. Lana Turner knew how bad her situation looked. Among the first people she called when Stompanato fell dead in her bedroom was Jerry Giesler, the lawyer who Hollywood turned to when it had to escape the consequences of its worst crimes. Giesler had defended the likes of megastar Errol Flynn, and had come to the defence of notorious gangster Bugsy Siegel. Crane would escape twice from a juvenile delinquency centre before finally living and working with her father at his Hollywood restaurant. The year after Stompanato's death, Turner would go on to star in Imitation of Life, the biggest success of her career, before taking a number of roles in theatre and television until her death in 1995. Cheryl Crane struggled with addiction before developing a career in real estate and settling down with Josh Leroy. She has always maintained that she alone was responsible for the murder of Johnny Stompanato and for no other reason than to protect her mother from an abusive boyfriend. If you liked this video don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here and if you want to support my work please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about that night when Lana Turner's daughter did what was probably needed to do? What is your opinion about the case?